Today's DAF is Eruvin Kafchet. Today's Shior is sponsored by Shari Mendes in honor of women's learning and the marriage this evening of her daughter Naomi to Menachem Lindner, Mazal Tov, and by Amy Kohn on the earth side of her father, Rav Dov Chaim Ben Zeev, Zichrono Levracha, who taught all his five da- daughters Talmud and the love of Torah. With that, we're going to get started um, with, well, review where we ended off yesterday. We saw that there was a debate about what one could use for an Eruv. Could one use fish brine versus the brine with fish in it, right? There was a machloka between Rabbi Yudah ben Gadish and Rabbi Lezer about whether it had to have fish in it or was enough that it was just the brine. And then we said that both of them use the type of learning, I'm sorry, use the type, right, the type of um, drush, style of darshan in the Torah called riboy mi'ut riboy which is different from klalu pratu klal. I want to just make it very clear. They both work in the same way. We take a verse that has a generalization, something specific, and a generalization. They call it something different. The style of riboy mi'ut riboy is the school of Rabbi Akiva, which is saying basically we're going to end up, when we view this generalization, specifics and generalization, we're going to end up including a lot more things in it. Klalu pratu klal is the style of Rabbi Ishmael. In fact, if you, in the prayers we say every morning, before Baruch Shama, Rabbi Yishmael Omer B'Shloshes Chlemidot HaTorah Nidreshet. And one of the, of the 13 is this Klalu Pratu Klal, and you'll notice he doesn't have Riboy Riboy, because you either go with one style or you go with the other. His approach is called Klalu Pratu Klal, which is the same idea. We take a verse that has something general, specific, and then general, which is our verse that we're talking about, where it says, you give the money for the Maaser with anything you want, B'chol Asher Taven that's very general. Then it starts listing specifics. Babakar, batzom, with cattle, sheep, yayin, ushechar, wine and, and beer. And then it says, b'chol asher shecha. Right, then it gets general again. So again, you can either call that riboy mi riboy, or you can call it klalu pratu klal. Klalu pratu klal, the rule is, we're only going to do it in a way that's similar to the prat. So now what we're going to see is, the first two we saw who include the brine, or the brine with the fish, both use riboy me ut riboy. And then they just have a small disagreement between them. But there's another two Tanaim who use the methodology of klal upratu klal, and they limit it more. So now the question is, what are they limiting? So we ended with this, what's ke'en prat? According to one, it has to be pre me pre vigidule karka, offspring that comes, right, like a, an offshoot of something else, either a vegetable that grows from another seed, or uh, a, an animal that grows from another animal, and it gets its sustenance from the ground. The other one, Tani Ida said, Ma pramifurash vla vladota aret, av ko vla vladota aret, has to be something that was created from the ground. So now they say, Well, what's the difference between them? My benayu, and we ended with a bayet. Okay, we're three lines from the bottom of Kafsai and Mubet. Amar abay dagim ika benayu. The difference between them is do we include fish or do we not include fish? If you say it has to be something that comes from another, so that fish is, and it gets its sustenance from the ground. Well, fish, right, they live in the water, but in the end, their sustenance comes from underground, which is under the water. So it does come from the ground. But the fish were created from the water, and that we see from the fifth day of creation. It says in Perak Aleph, Chapter one of Breshit, Pasuk Kaf, 20. Vayom Elohim yishritzu hamayim sheretz nefesh chaya vaof yofef ala aretz al penei rekiya shamayim. From the water is going to come all these creepy crawlers that are in the water and the birds. So basically we're going to see both birds, although we're going to get back to the birds. We're going to see something strange about the birds. But according to this verse, the birds and the fish are both created from the water, not from the ground. So if you say vlav ladot aretz, you're not going to include fish. If you say gidule karka, you will include fish. But now they question this. Umiya bar abaye, tagim gidule karka ninu? Did he really say that tagim get their sustenance from the ground? What's the issue? Well, we're going to take a different issue where fish come up. And this is if you eat a fish that's tame, a non-kosher fish, what, are, how many sets of lashes do you get? Okay, what we're going to learn is, now according to the shot of this sugya, the Rambam has a whole different way of reading this. I'll just mention the Rambam very briefly, but first I'll mention the regular reading, which is, if we have a number of um, times where the Torah warns us, do not do this, 
you get lashes for each time. If it says, don't do this, don't do that, even if it's talking about the same thing, you're going to get multiple sets of lashes. Okay, now, when it comes to lashes, you generally get 39. If someone can't handle that many, then you get less. But if, let's say, you, let's say you have to get 39, we're gonna see now times four, times five, times six. Obviously, if you can't handle all those, they won't give you that many. But the idea being here is that they say you get multiple sets of lashes for certain things because there are a number of warnings about this in the Torah. So we're gonna talk about what these are. We're gonna see for putita, which is a type of fish, you're gonna get four. For a nimala, an ant, you're gonna get five sets of lashes. And for a tzira, a hornet, you're gonna get six. And what we're gonna see here is that they put the, de the fish here, the putita, in the category of those that grow, those that get their sustenance from the water, not the ground. So we're gonna see here, if it got its sustenance from the ground, there would have been more sets of lashes given to this. The Ramba, by the way, and this comes up in one of the debates between him and the Ramban and the Sefer HaMitzvot. The Ramban has the Sefer HaMitzvot and the Ramban has his footnotes on it and he argues you know, his, his commentary on the Ramban. He has all these comments where he disagrees with the Rambam. This is one of the issues they have. But the Rambam says if you have multiple warnings for the same thing, you don't get multiple lashes. He would have to explain this sugya somewhat differently. Anyway, let's read according to the basic, the other interpretation. So doesn't Abaye say, and that's he himself, he right now said the difference between them would be fish because fish do get their sustenance from the ground, but they weren't created from the ground. So now, arba. you get four sets of lashes. If you look at the sheet that I made for today, I brought all the psukim here. There's two psukim about general shratzim, which are creepy crawlers that we're not allowed to eat. So it says, al tichaksuet nafshotichem b'chol sheretz hashoretz. Below to tamu him. So there it says, don't just don't uh, make your soul disgrace. Uh, I can't think of the word tishaksu, uh, <coughs> disgrace or something along those lines. And lo to him and don't become impure to them. So that's already two. That's any kind of sheret, okay, non kosher creature. Now we have three verses that talk about shratzim that are on land two that are on water, and one birds that fly. And that's where we're going to get to all these different interpretations. I'm not going to read them all inside, but you could see it's in Vayikra, Yud Aleph, Mem Aleph, Mem Bet, Mem Gimel, okay, chapter 11, verses 41, 42, 44, are all the ones about the ones on the land. The two in the water come from Vayikra, Yud Aleph, verse Yud Aleph, 11, 11, and Dvalim Yud Dalid, chapter 14, Pasuk Yud, the 10th Pasuk, also talks about right? If it doesn't have scales and fins, you can't eat it. And it also says, don't eat the shekets and you know all the disgraceful stuff in Yudab, in Bayikra. So basically, just to make it simple, there's two verses generally. There's two about uh, water creatures, three about land, one about birds. So if you eat a putita, you get four sets. Why do you get four sets? Two for the general, two for the ones on uh, in the water. What isn't listed here? All the ones on land. Theoretically, if you say they get their sustenance from the land, then they should also be included in shretzim of the land. One could maybe argue with this because maybe it's not exactly the same, but the assumption is anything that kind of gets its sustenance from the land would also be included in sheret ha'aretz. Nimala, so something that crawls on the ground, this is obviously right, a fit, uh, an ant, lo kechamesh, gets five, why? Three for the ones on land and two for the general. Sira, a hornet, lo kechesh, because it's also on land, so it gets the five that the ant got, and in addition, it gets the one for the flying creatures. So now we have, im ita putita, if putita really is nizom menakarka, gets its sustenance from the ground, and we would put it in that category, and that would be the difference between these two opinions, Nami lil kemishum sheretz hashoretz al aret. So it should get another. It should get another three sets, and therefore, and now, now look, Abai is the one who put a minute ago or three minutes ago. He put the dagim in the category of gidule karka, but he's also the one who said that you only get four sets and you don't get seven. So Abai himself seems to contradict, and therefore Ravina comes up with a different explanation. He says it's not that it's fish that ikabenayu. Ella Amaravina ofot ikabenayu. It's birds that are the distinction between them. Okay, birds are the issue. Lemanda ama pri mi pri vigidule karka hane nami gidule karka nini. Right, these are born from one another, and they also get their sustenance from the land. But lemanda amarva vlad vladota aret hane ofot. This is going to be interesting to you. Mina rakak nivru. They were created from mud. Okay, what is mud? Mud is a combination of 
water, and land. So now we're going to see that birds, now where do they get this from? So the verse I read you earlier seemed to say the birds were created from the water, because it said, Yishritzu amayim, sheretz nefesh chaya, va'ofi ofefa la'aret, which included fish and birds, flying creatures. They were created on day number five. But if you look in Bereshit, that was all in Genesis chapter one. If you look in Genesis chapter two, which already we, when we had the Dupart Sufim, we talked about that there's differences between the versions of Bereshit chapter one and Bereshit chapter two, but I didn't mention them, which I didn't mention it because I thought it was obvious, but maybe I should say things that are obvious, which is, you know, the biblical critics claim that Bereshit Perak Aleph and Bereshit Perak Bet were written by different authors, and that's why they have different, different versions. The Gemara tries to resolve the different versions, they were aware of this issue. It's not like they didn't understand that issue. I mean, there weren't biblical critics in their time, but, or maybe they were, we just didn't call the biblical critics like we do nowadays. But they had a different approach, which is, no, let's try to resolve these contradictions. And what did they say? If you look in Breshit, Perak Bet, Genesis chapter two, verse 19, it says, this is exactly when God says, it's not good for man to live alone, and he's going to create a woman for man, but first he looks around to all the creatures that are in existence and says, let's try to see if God can mate with one of these. And it says, So God had created from the land. Notice what it says here. It's describing what had already happened. It says, God had created from the land, all the creatures on land, right? The, the animals and all the birds. So from this verse, it sounds like God created birds from the land. So that seems to contradict what we just said in the, in the first chapter where God created from the water. So what's the obvious resolution of this? Well, birds were created from, so, or any flying creatures, not just birds, were created from a combination of water and land, which we would call mud, okay? So if that's the case, it's not called Vlad Vladota Aretz because it's not from the land, it's from mud. And therefore, we're going to say the one who says vla vla aret is going to exclude birds. The one who says gidule karka is going to include birds because birds do get their sustenance from the land. And that's the difference between these two tanaim. Can you make an error with birds or can you not? So now they say, um, now they're going to talk about, we talked about this klalu pratu klal. We're going to find out something interesting about it. So the first thing we saw that was interesting was that the same type of drasha, klalu pratu klal, ribuy mu ribuy, is there's two styles of how to deal with this kind of thing when you find it in the verse. There's one that's more inclusive, there's one that's more exclusive, right? So the Klalu Prat to Klal, we already said is more exclusive. It's gonna to have to be more similar to the Prat in order to be included. Whereas the Riboy Mew Riboy is gonna make it much more general. It has to be just vaguely similar to the Prat, not so similar. But now we're gonna learn that within Klalu Prat to Klal, because both these Tanaim had a debate about this, and they both darsh in klalu pratu klal. So how did we get that one included more and one excluded more? So that's what we're going to say now. Man de marabe ofot my time, uman de ofot my time. So now they're going to say that there's a different approach within klalu pratu klal. And the assumption here is that klalu pratu klal was an outgrowth of either, if you know the list of the 13, one of them is klalu prat, when you have a generalization and then specifics. One is prat uklal, when you first start with specifics, then you move to generalization, and then there's klalu prat uklal. So these seem like three different options, right? Where the Torah sometimes starts off specifics without a general rule and then goes to general, sometimes starts with a general rule, then goes to specifics, and sometimes has both. So what this Gemara is going to say is that the klalu prat uklal is actually an outgrowth of either a prat uklal or a klalu prat, one of them. And klalu prat and pratu klal are different the way you darshan them. Whether one came first or one came second affects, right, whether the detail came in the beginning or the detail came at the end affects whether it's going to be more inclusive or more limiting, okay? Less limiting, more limiting. And then if you're going to say the klalu pratu klal is an outgrowth of one of those, if it's the one that's more limiting, then we'll be more limiting. And if it's the one that's more inclusive, we're going to be more inclusive. So even though we compare klalu pratu klal and said it's more limiting than the riboy mi utu riboy, there's still going to be a debate within klalu pratu klal, right? It's on a scale. Riboy mi riboy will be the most inclusive, the least limiting. But then within klalu pratu klal, we're going to have two approaches. One is a more limited approach and one is a less limited approach. So it's all a matter of relatively. So now, and by the way, there's proof for this because that this is the case historically because Rabbi Yishma's list 
is a, has 13 and these are all three listed. But Hillel has an earlier list of only seven. Hillel lived before Rabbi Ishmael and Hillel much earlier, and he has a list of seven. And within his seven, there's Klal Uprat and there's Pratu Klal, but there isn't Klal Upratu Klal. So this shows you that an earlier list that didn't exist. And that was really an outgrowth of one of the two. So now we're going to read this inside. The one who has the more inclusive approach. He says the more important klal is the last one. And that when we look at a klal, pratu klal, it's built first by a pratu klal, the later, the latter one. Then when you add the original klal, we're going to be, okay, remember, this is the one that's more inclusive. So let's see. He's going to say, um, prat uklal. So first you start off with a prat uklal. Now what's the rule for a prat uklal? Naaset klal mosif ala prat. You start off very specific, but then you end very general. So if you end very general, we're going to assume you must be including a lot of other things. Then, so it rabu luhu kol mile. So then, even though you started very specific, you had the generalization, which includes all sorts of other things. Now, if you add to that now all of a sudden a klal in the beginning, we're now going to take something that we all of a sudden included so many things, and now the original claw, the first claw, not the original, I made a mistake, I mean the first one, which really is the least less important one, is now coming to say, well, we already did the Pratu claw, and we already included all sorts of things. Now we're going to limit all sorts of things to sorts of things, but not all sorts of things. We're going to limit it more, but not a ton. So that's how we're going to get to that birds are included, because we're going to say, well, it has to be similar. And in this case, it's called the Dami Lemi Shneit Stadim, Vidule Karka, and um, what did we say? Uh, primi Pri, which is then going to include birds. He's obviously going to say the opposite. We start off, the first one is the more important one. So now, Klalu Prat, when you have a Klalu Prat, what's the rule? It's a much more limiting rule. When you start off very general and then the Torah gets very specific, we're going to say it's only what's specified and not, even though we started off general, since we end, it's almost like saying, and there's a whole debate in the Gemara about this, when you speak and you say something and then you change what you say, do we go by the first thing you said or do we go by the second thing you said? So this is kind of saying the way it ends is more significant. So if we end it with a klal, then it's going to be much more inclusive. If we end it with a prat, it's going to be much more limiting. So if we say the, the first klal is the more important, so then we start off with a klal prat, where we start off with something already very, very limited. When we add the klal at the end then, so because again, this is an outgrowth, the klal prat to klal is an outgrowth of a klal prat. So he's going to say, honey, so first he says, I didn't read fully, when you have a klal uprat, ein b'chalal alamashu b'prat, and therefore hani in midi achrini lo, so it's only going to be the things listed, which would be the bakar tzon, yayin and shechal. Vahane klal batra, but then when it goes and all of a sudden includes all sorts of other things, well, it's going to include more things, but it's going to have to be very similar to the pratim. Liribuye called the damele, and in our case, it'll be mishloshat stadim. Okay, if you take this to other cases, it might be more, it might be less, but in any case, this is going to be more limiting than the other approach, and it's going to have to have all three. And the birds aren't included in all three because we add now the Vlad, the Vlad Vladot Aret. It has to have been created from the ground. And we said birds are not created from the ground, but from the mud, which is not considered ground. And therefore, it's not going to be included. So that's the approach of this Klalu Pratu Klal. It's interesting to see, right, that it's an outgrowth of a previous one. And then there's a debate which one. We're now going to, until close to the end of the daf, deal with this line. Rav, they basically quote a halacha in the name of Rav, that ma'arvim bepa'apu'in u'bechag leglagot u'begud gadaniot, avalo bechaziz velo bekafniot. Okay, unlikely that you understood any of the words in that, in that sentence. Okay, so well, the words you probably understood were ma'arvim, but not those. Okay, so one can use for the following, one can make an Arab out of the following items. Okay, now we're going to read what these things are. Okay, in the Koran, they're usually very good for this, the Steinzels, what all these things are. So chaglegalagot, it's unclear exactly what it is, but some people say it's purslane. Okay, good gedaniot is sweet clover. Um, chaziz is, right, I think I skipped one. Um, sorry, let me look inside. Um, right, papuin, right, we didn't explain papuin. It's a bit of a debate what exactly papuin is. Some say it's cress. 
Okay, so cress, purslane, sweet clover. These are things that are basically, according to the, the Steinzeltz, the current, they call it unimportant. Okay, they're cheap and unimportant produce, but they are produce. People eat them. Just it's, Most people don't eat them because they're very cheap and not so great. So those things can be eaten, it can be used for your Arab since they're, they, they're edible. Okay, so not chaziz. What is chaziz? Chaziz is when you grow your grain, there's the, the vegetable part of it or the, the stalk, I assume they mean, or something that you can eat it while it's not yet ripened. And then really when you grow grains, you grow them for the kernel. So they're gonna call that the seed here, okay? So here, if you eat it for the kernel, Okay, the chaziz is the green part, I'm sorry, not the kernel, the green part of it that generally you might just use for animal fodder or, or you wouldn't even use it at all. So that's the part that, that we're talking about. You can't use that for your eru. And not kafniot, kafniot are unripe dates. So now the Gemara is going to go through this list. Ubegud ganiot, mima arvin, right? We understand why we're here because remember, where do we start in our parak? All about what foods you can use. Remember we said not water and salt, but then we said there's all sorts of other exceptions. So here's a list of things that one cannot use for erv or can. Okay, debate about what can or what can't. So now they're going to ask, good ganiot, mima arvin, can you really use good ganiot? Vahatanya, good ganiot, merube banim yochelu, chasuche banim lo yochelu. If you have lots of children and you have no issues with reproductive issues, so go for it, eat good ganiot. But if you have reproductive issues, these are not healthy for you, okay? They're not good and you shouldn't eat them. And once they harden, come like a seed, then no one eats them. They're disgusting, right? They're not edible. So here you see they're not fully edible because people with reproductive issues shouldn't eat them. And they even later they get hardened and they're not edible at all. So how do we explain this? So three answers are given because our, our source said, Rav said, you can use them for a roof. So either we say, they would have to, uh, sorry, it would be a case where they didn't harden. And specifically, we're talking about people who have children and don't have issues. And therefore, for them, it would be okay to eat, to use for your a roof. A second option, even if you can't eat them yourself. What did we learn in our Mishnah? Milo Tznan, did we not learn, right? Even though you can't eat them, but other people can eat them. And since Milo Tznan, doesn't it say in our Mishnah, remember someone who can't eat truma because he's not a Kohen, is still allowed to make an Eru because, again, there was a debate about this, because other people can eat it. Or um, the Nazir who can't drink wine, but can still use it for his Eru, because other people can drink the wine. So therefore you could say here, even though some people don't eat it, still it doesn't matter. Even those people can use it for their Eruv since other people can eat it. Next. Um, next option, third answer. Uh, sorry, let's just keep reading. I didn't finish to the end. Alma, therefore you can learn from our Mishnah. Even though it's not usable for that person, it is for somebody else. Hachanami, you can say the same thing here. Okay, even though it's not, can't be used for the chasuchei banim, but it can be used for the merubei banim. Third option, Ah, there was a version from Madai and from Miris, and those were better, okay? There's a different strain of it, which was edible, and maybe that's what they're talking about. Okay, next. Chazizlo. Um, so that was the question on the good gadaniyot. Now we're moving on to Chaziz. We said, Chaziz, you can't use for Eruv. So now they're going to say, Vahama Rav Yehuda Marav. Now this was in the name of Rav, we said you can't use it. And now we have another statement by Rav Yehuda in the name of Rav. Kishut v'chaziz marvim behen. Number one, he says, you can do an Eruv with them. Okay. Um, and second, Kishut, I just can't remember what all these things are. Kishut, we said is, right, uh, daughter. Okay. Daughter and um, you can use them for Eruv, and as we're talking about the green part, it sounds like, and you can use them for Eruv, and if you were to break a, break a bracha on it, you would say, Bore So what do they answer? Lokashya, and here we have a fascinating answer. All sorts of things changed when Rav came to Babel. Many of them were because he made this great center in the middle of Babel. This is an interesting one. Until he came to Babel, he never saw anyone who ate this. 
when he got to Babel, he realized the Babylonians, by the way, this is interesting. Remember they ate that kuta habavli, which was disgusting. And we had a whole discussion about they eat all sorts of disgusting foods. Here's another good example. They ate something that nobody else ate. But when he got to Babel, he realized people ate this. So he said, oh, if people eat it, then you can use it for an Eruv. Now you would think that the sugya would end there and it makes a lot of sense that basically the sugya ends here because there we said he ate, um, you know, he got to Babel and he decided based on what he saw in Babel. So the Babylonians think this, see this as food. And we assumed that he's basically ruling for the people in Babylonia. Since you treat this as food, you can use your Eruv. But the Gemara views Rav's Psak as all encompassing, meaning that everywhere people can use this for Eruv. And he says, Ubavel have Yeruba da Alma, the Gemara asks, what? Babel is the, is, is the majority of people in the world? In other words, just the Babylonians eat this. Nobody else eats this. You're going to rule halacha based on this minority of people in Babylonia and rule for everybody? Don't we say, Vahatanya, Hafur Vaseora Vatiltan Shazaran Liyerek, Vatladato Etzokol Adam. If you plant fool, okay, type of bean, and barley, and tiltan, um, what all these words are. Um, tiltan is fenugreek. Okay, you planted these. Shezaran liyerek. You planted them for not their seed. Normally you use them for their seeds, but not for their seed, but for the green part of them, for the vegetable part of them or the, the growth. Betalada ato, it's a koladam. We basically go by, even though you planted it for some unique purpose, we don't hold by you, we hold by the general. This is always right? How subjective, objective do we make things? This is saying we go objectively by what everyone does, the majority. Lefichach, and therefore the Brita continues, Zra'an chayav yarakan patur. Now we're talking about, are you obligated to tithe the produce? Take ma'asro. So if zra'an chayav yarakan patur, if you, for the seed, you have to take, for the green part of it, no, you don't. Hashachalayim bahagargir shezra'an liyerek, okay, now we have kress and arugula, that you planted for the yerek, for the green part, mitaslim yerek vizera. Okay, if you planted them for the green part, even though, right, this, we're gonna talk about cress and arugula are planted for both, right? We eat the greenery part of the arugula, right? And cress, so both of these things are used both for their seeds and for their green, for their leaves. So they say, these are in a different category. This is just all the brights that we're quoting to question. This is no longer relevant for our purposes, but it's saying, if Zara the Yerek, Metaslim Yerek Vizera, you'd have to, even if your intent, here we go with intent, you intended for the green part, but you have to actually take Masro on both parts. In other words, if you decide to eat even the seed, you'd have to take Masro. Zara the Zera, and if you planted it for specifically the seed, Metaslim Zera Vizera, both of them have to be tithed also because. In the end, people eat both. But the main part for us was, if you take things that are generally meant for the seed and you eat the green part, the yeret, the, the leafy part, then even if you're going against the grain, we're not gonna rule by you. We're gonna rule by what the average person does. So just because in, Babylon they eat, in Babylonia they eat this shouldn't mean that we also eat it, that we would basically rule in general, that we make a bore priyadama and we can use them for eruv. Since nobody else does, we go by the majority. So how can we explain this? So the first answer given is Kika Marav Bidagnu Niata, which I'm sure makes a lot of sense to you. Right? There's a lot of words in today's stuff that are unclear. What do they say? Rashi explains this is the garden variety. Okay, the garden variety is edible, and that's what we're talking about. Okay, sorry, that is the final answer. Okay, then the garden variety, it's edible, and that's what he meant that you make an Erevan and that you make Boy Priyadaman. But when he was talking about it by us, he wasn't talking about the garden variety, he was talking about the regular variety. Now we're going to talk about arugula since we mentioned it. Zera gargir la What do what do people use this for? Because generally arugula is for the leaves. We get to learn about their their culinary uh, expertise or how they did things. If they didn't have pepper, they would grind it up and they would put it they would put it on their roasted meat. Okay, so if anyone's ever stuck, if you don't have the proper spices, you could take the seed of the arugula which is a lot less common to be found, but right, you can use that on your roasted meat. Rabbi Zera, now we're gonna have a story. And with the story, we're gonna hear a debate about some of the things we talked about before. Rabbi Zera, when he got old and he can no longer learn, what did he do? He would go to the entrance of the Beit Midrash of Rabbi Yudabar Ami, 
Amar kinaf kevai le rabanan iku mikamai vakabal buhu igma. When the rabbis come in and out, I'll stand up before them and I'll get rewarded. You know, I'll get sahar. Okay, it's a little bit strange. Didn't we learn in Perkavot that you can't do things just to get rewarded? My reading of this is not that he really wanted, he was saying, I'm doing this for the reward, but he was trying to say, I want to spend my time doing something valuable. I can't learn anymore, so let me stand outside the Beit Midrash. And we're going to see it's not just the reward he gets or, or the importance of standing up for Tamidei Chachamim when they leave the Beit Midrash, but also he would ask them questions about something they learned. He didn't have the strength to sit and really learn, but he did have the strength to engage in a small conversation about it, which is what's going to happen. So what happens? Nafik ata yenuka de rab. Okay, you see the contrast. We have the very elderly rabbi you can't even learn anymore, and we have this young, young student. Okay, yenuka comes from the language of tinok, a baby. It doesn't really mean a baby, but a young student. So he hears this young student comes out. Amar le mai agmarach rabech. He says, what did your teacher teach you today? Amar le kishut bore priyadama. Okay, kishut, which I see also is translated as hops. You say a borei priyadama on them, okay? You make the bracha borei priyadama, and chaziz shakon yebidvaro. So we treat these differently. Hops get a borei priyadama, but chaziz, the green part of this grain that we're growing, gets a shahako, right? When it's unripened, we say shahako. So Amalei, Rabbi Zeyra says to him, ad rabba, it should be the opposite. Ipcha mistabra, it sounds like exactly the reverse. Because hai me'ara kamerabe, v'hai me'avira kamerabe. Okay, how does the hops grow? It's a parasitic plant, that wraps itself around some sort of a bush and gets its nourishment from there. So what does he say? The chaziz grows from the ground. It gets its nourishment from the ground. So we should say, says. but the hops is parasitic and it gets its nourishment from the air. Now we're going to see it's not exactly right, but that's what he suggests. So now the Gemara tells us, Interestingly, we don't pass him like Rabbi Zera, who was a seasoned elderly rabbi. We actually pass him like the student. He knew better, right? So this is a good example of, you know, you're smarter than a fifth grader, you know that game, right? Because when you're in school, you're really up on everything. So he says, he knew better, why my taima? Ha gmar pele, ha lav gmar pele. When it comes to saying bore priyadama, you need something that's the final fruit. It's already ripened. And the chazuz is not ripened, whereas the kashut is already ripened. Umay de karma le haime ara karabe, bahaime avira karabe. What about Rabbi Zeris, um, his claim? So lohi, it's actually not true because kishut nami me'ara karabi, they both actually get their sustenance from the ground. Why is that? Tahakachazina, we see that katlina lelizmata umayte kishuta. If we cut the bush and the bush was no longer connected to the ground, then the kishut that was wrapped around it, right? We all know this. When you have a parasitic fruit or a parasitic plant, it lives on the on the bush, but the bush has to be attached to the ground. So even though it's indirectly getting it from the ground, it's clearly getting its nourishment from the ground because if you were to get rid of the bush, obviously the parasitic plant would die. So therefore, it really is from the ground. They're both from the ground. Just one gets a boy pradama because it's a finished product, the hops, whereas the chaziz is actually unripe, right? That's why it's still green. Okay, moving on to the next item of Rav in back, way back in the middle of Amun Aleph. Ube kafniot ein ma'arvin. So kafniot, these unripe dates, you don't make an air, you can't use them for a roof. The hatanya, again, we're going to bring another source. It says in the Braita, kor nikaf bekesef maser. Okay, we're going to talk about kor and kafniot. Kor is hearts of palm. The idea about hearts of palm, right? They grow in the palm tree. When they're soft, you can eat them. When they, you have to actually do something with them to eat them, but you can eat them. When they, when you leave them and you don't take them out of the tree, they harden and become part of the tree. Another thing about them that's interesting that we're going to see later is that when you take them out of the tree, they actually destroy the tree, okay? It's not good for the tree to take out the hearts of palm. It's interesting. I don't know enough about the whole production of them and, and why we eat these, but it sounds like if you care about nature, maybe it's a little bit problematic to eat them, but I don't know. One can look it up more, but that's what I, I saw written about it. So now we're going to talk about these kafniot, vahatanya. So first we're going to talk about the core, the hearts of palm. That's just brought in because the kafniot come up in the same source. The unripe, again, the kafniot are the unripe dates. Kornikach bekesef maser, ve'em metame tumat ochrim. So core, you can buy hearts of palm with the, um, with the money, the maser money. Remember, that's when you go to the Beit HaMikdash and you have, into Jerusalem, you have to buy with your maser sheni money. But they're not considered food for the purposes of Tumah, so they can't become impure. Okay, the unripe dates can be bought with Master Shani just like the core. 
Umitamo tumat ochlin, and they're also considered food. So now you're going to see, if they're considered food, then why can't you use them for Erev purposes? Rabbi Yehuda Omer, we're just continuing in the Brayta now. He has a debate, okay? I charted this out. You can look at the sheet. Kor hareu ke'etz l'chol dvarav. Okay, the parts of palm are considered a tree for all intents and purposes. Ela shenikach bekesef maaser. Except for you can buy maaser sheni with your maaser sheni money. This is a little bit strange because he says it in a bit of a different wording, but he really sounds like he's saying the same thing as Tanakama. The Gemara is going to ask that later. What's the difference? Because they both seem to say, yes, maaser, Shani money, but not Tumat Ochlin. Okay, so we'll see what the difference is. Be Kafniot, Harein Kapri Lechol Debrehen. Kafniot, also Rabbi Yehuda thinks they were pre for all intents and purposes. The one exception, and this is different from what Tanakama said, Ela Shepturim Min Since they're not a completed fruit, okay, it's unripe. So you don't have to take, you don't have to tithe them. You don't have to take the true mona maschot on them. That's different than be buying them for kes- with kesav master shani money. Two different master issues. So how do we explain this contradiction? So they say, hatam b'dinishane. Ah, this is nishane. What does that mean? We're talking about when the Brita says that they're considered food, they mean from male trees, okay, the male palm trees, Osim kafniyot ve'enam nasim tzmarim le'olam. Rashi explains that they never become ripe. That the fully ripened is this. This unripe is the farthest that they get. Okay, you can make jokes about men and maturity and all that, but okay, I'll leave that aside this is just as a joke. But they're saying the male trees never fully ripen. So because of that, these, un, uh, these unripe, sorry, the, uh, did I say figs? I meant dates. These unripe dates are the final product in this tree. And that's why they're considered food. But when Rav was talking, he wasn't talking about these. Well, the Gemara says, and that's why I said you don't make an Erev on them, because they're not, these unripe dates nobody eats. So then they say, wait a minute. If this is the final product, then why would Rabbi Yehuda say they're exempt from Maser? Don't we have a Brayta that says, Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Lo uzkaru pagei baitune, elelinyam Maser bovat. He says explicitly, pagim are unripe figs, and the ahine de tuvina are the unripe dates. And basically what he says here is, right, the reason why these were mentioned was to teach you for the purposes of maser, meaning that these things are actually obligated in maser because for them, the male tree, that was the final product. So therefore, they're obligated in maser. So therefore, it can't be talking about that because if it was really male, the Rabbi Yehuda would agree. This is Rabbi Yehuda. We just quoted that it is obligated to tithe them. That's not what we were talking about. We're saying that these are different. Why is that? In other words, they can't be used for Eruv. But they can be, we can say that they can, they can become impure. They are food. Now we start distinguishing. For laws of impurity, the rules are different than they are for Eruv. What do you need for Eruv? You need food that you can eat right away. These are not edible right away. However, they can be made edible if you roast them, okay? So, or toast them. So they're going to say here, for in the to an ochlin, since, or just like Rabbi Yochanan says elsewhere, since you can roast them and make them edible, hachanami, same thing we would say here, or therefore they're going to have too much ochlin to them, but they're not, going to be used for Eruv, because right now they're not edible. Hecha itmar de Rabbi Yochanan. So where did Rabbi Yochanan say this thing about, since they can be roasted, we can eat them? So he said it here. Ahadatanya, shkedim hamarim, bitter uh, almonds. Ktanim chayavim, gdolim pturim. Now we're talking again about the laws of tithing. If they're small, they're obligated. You have to do the trumot When Because when they're small, they're not ripe yet, but they are edible at that point. They're not yet fully bitter. But once they're gdolim and they become very bitter, they're pturim because nobody would eat them. Mitukim, when they're sweet, almonds, gdolim chayavim ktanim pturim, because the ktanim aren't yet ready, but the gdolim are. Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Yossi Omer, Mishum Aviv, Zel v'zel iktor, both the bitter small ones and large ones are exempt because the small ones are not ripe and the big ones are not edible, are not, you know, nobody would eat them, they're too bitter. V'amrelan, some say, zev v'zel l'chiyuv, both the small and the large and the ripe uh, bitter almonds are actually obligated in Trumot HaMashot. And Amar Rabbi Ila, Hora Rabbi Chanina B'Tzipori, Kedivrei HaOmer, Zev Zelik Tor, the bright ends with 
the Psak Halacha here that we said Zeb Tor, actually they're all exempt. But the Gemara now wants to go into this opinion that we saw earlier. If you say both are obligated to tie them, well, what do they, what do you do with these? Nobody eats them. So that's where he said his comment. You can actually toast them and they can become edible. Amar Mar. Now we're going back to something we saw at the beginning of the page. Okay, at the beginning of this side of the page. I think it's at the beginning of the page. Anyway, it was earlier today. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, kol hareyu ke'etz l'chol t'barab. These hearts of palm, Rabbi Yehuda said, this is back to the question I mentioned earlier. Ela shenikach b'kesef master sheni. He says, they're considered like a tree, they're not fruits at all, but you can actually purchase them with your master sheni money. Hainu Tanakama, that sounds exactly like Tanakama who said, actually, it was just a few lines above, it's about 15 lines up. Um, Tanakama had said, Kor nikach b'kesef maser ve'eim etami tumat ofli. Yes, you can use your master sheni money to buy it, but it's not impure. So it sounds like the same thing, meaning it's not considered fruits for, it's not a food. So aren't they saying the same thing? Amar abaye shal kuvetignu If you boil them or, or fry them, that's the machloka between them. Meaning if you turn them into something edible, right, hearts of palm, we don't eat, we eat them in a can, they're already processed. So once you process them, that's the machloka. So one will say they're considered food, one will not. Remember Rabbi Yehuda says, haren ke'etz l'chol davar. That means even if you, do something to them and make them edible, we're still going to treat them like a tree and none of the other laws apply. But what would anybody say that once you make them edible, we don't consider them food? But Hatanya doesn't it say in another bright as something similar? Ha'or, the hide, the the placenta, they're not edible, so therefore there's no impurity of food on them. But or but if you cook up the skin and it becomes right, people eat skin of, of meat. So if you eat the skin, it turns edible or a shilia that you intend to join. Generally, people don't eat the placenta. But if you said, I'm going to eat the placenta, then it does become food and it is impure. It can become impure. So therefore, it doesn't make sense that that's a machloka between them. Nobody would think once it's edible, of course it's edible and it's food. Elam rava ika benayu bracha. Says the machloka between them is about what blessing you make on them. Itmar, as it says in another place, that there's a machloket about this. Kor, what bracha do you make on hearts of palm? This is a good relevant question. If you eat hearts of palm, what blessing? Rabbi Yehuda Amar, borei priyadama. Okay, he views it as something that grows from the ground because it grows in the tree. So it's not a fruit of the tree, so you wouldn't say borei priyadama, but it grows from the ground. Ushmo Amar, shakol niyebit varo. He says it's shahakol. Okay, because it's not really part of the tree. So we're going to see their debate. Rabbi Yehuda Amar, borei priyadama. Uchluhu, it's food. And therefore, we're going to, and it grows from the ground, so it's Borei Priyadama. Ushmuel Amar, Shakol Niyabit Varo, Kevan de Sofol Akshot, since if we left it in the tree, it would eventually harden, become part of the tree. Lomar Bachina, Lai Borei Priyadama, we make it a Shahakol on it. So here's an interesting thing that happens. Shmuel disagree with Rav Yehuda, but Amar Le Shmuel or Rav Yehuda, Shinina, remember he was his student. He said, Oh, you're a brilliant student. Kabatech Mistabra, you know what? I think your, your opinion is more correct than mine. Dahat's known, because look at a radish. So folak showed, eventually, if you leave it in the ground, it will harden and be inedible. And yet we make a bracha, borei priyadama on it. So therefore, this would be the same. If you leave it, it will harden. So we should make a borei priyadama. I guess you're right. But now the Gemara tells us, even though Shmuel kind of agreed with Rabbi Yehuda, the lohi, it's not true. Snon nate inashe adata de publa. Dikla lo nate inashe adata de kora. Snon is planted for the purposes of eating the radish. But the... Dekel tree is not planted for the hearts of palm. And as I said before, they even destroy the tree. So therefore, you're going to make a shahakal on them. But Alpha Gav de Kase Shmuel, the Rabbi and even though we praised him and thought he was right, we actually pass on like Shmuel and you make a shahakal niya bidvaro on them. Okay, last thing for today, Gufa. Now we're going to go into Amar of Yudam Arav. Okay, we said before, Kishut v'chaziz ma'arvin v'hen umarachin alahem b'roi priyadama. So you can use them for Eruv and you can make b'roi priyadama. Now we want to know how much you need enough for two meals worth. So how much is enough for two meals worth of this kind of food? Kishut bakama kedam Rabbi Yechiel kimelo ayad, a handful. Hachanami kimelo ayad. So just like Rabbi Yechiel says elsewhere, handful, he would also say it here. Chaziz bakama, what about this chaziz? Amarab abartuvia barayitz hagamarav kimelo uzilata di ikari, like a bundle of, a farmer's bundle. That's the amount that's two meals worth. Amarav chelki abartuvia ma'arvim bekalya. So he says, you can do an eruv with a kalya. Okay, um, 
Rashi says it's like a stalk of, of, a, of a type of plant. They say, but nobody eats that. They mean the green part of the stalk, the edible part. This is where Rabbi Chiel said, that we just kind of attached it to the hops. He went out to the village. They asked him, can we use soft fool? Okay, those type of beans when they're still moist. Usually they, they harden. We use them hard. He didn't know. When he got to the Beit in the city, they said, this is what Rabbi Yana said, Marvin Befulin Lachim, Bekama, and again, Amr Bichiel Kimaloa Yad, a handful. Okay, so we have a handful for most of the things, except for the, the stalks, right, the green part of the, of the grains, and that we said, a bundle, a farmer's bundle. Okay, we're going to end here for today. Tomorrow we're going to pick up with more measurements of how much of each thing you need. We get into a whole discussion about beets, which they call tradine, spinach, but it's really the beets, and we'll talk about what they say about that. Okay, Shavuot to everyone.